Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be doing a first impressions analysis of a data set that was requested by one of my viewers, uh, Brendan Knox. He had the idea, a few likes and comments on that one, so here we are diving into the second half data in this video. Remember, if you have any ideas for content that you want me to uh, apply some analysis to, leave them in the comments section. I'll see if I can find time to fit them in before the season starts. Um, if not, it could be good mid-season to have some ideas in the bank. Um, and we can discuss that later after the drafting period. But for today, uh, introduction. So we're looking at the data from the second half of the season. Um, now, the second half of the season is uh, essentially, um, you know, just to, to try to get a better sense of what the overall picture is. So if you're looking at last year's data, uh, you're going to miss some of the trends, some of the guys who started cold or were injured and then turned it on late that kind of thing. And that's what we want to look at today. This is kind of like a magnifying glass for last year's data. If you're in your draft suite and whatever you're looking at is uh, either projections for this year or stats from last year, you're going to miss out on a lot of context that could potentially help your team. And it could help you find deeper value depending on you know some of these factors because some of these guys are definitely second half players and they stepped it up in the second half of last season. So this could be a, a good tool to use uh, if you're looking to try to find value deeper in your draft or even at the top of the draft, because obviously a guy like Austin Matthews went off in the second half, um, but he was pretty good all season long. Obviously, he won the Hart Trophy, so he was pretty consistent all the way throughout. But um, this will give you a better sense of what we're looking at in terms of you know potential carryover from last season to this season. So when we're looking at the data, this is a data set from January 26th to May 1st. Um, and I only extracted the top 200 point per game players just to keep it kind of manageable because if you're going to put in, you know, 800 plus players, you know, most of them are not fantasy relevant. So it's not worth the extra time uh, to take to try to fit those into this data set. As you can see, some of these uh, these lists grow a little bit longer. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult to manage, you know, an 800 person data set in this type of environment. Um, especially if it's not necessary. If it is necessary, then that's what we do. But if, if it's not, and we're we're looking at the top 200 because basically the top 250 is what you're looking at in terms of a 12-team league. That's what you're going to find. But you're not always looking for the top 250 point-per-game players. Sometimes you're looking for hits or blocks. Sometimes you're looking for goalies. So this is basically um, like a general idea of what would be fantasy relevant. Um, and then for all of these categories, I've used mostly the standard categories goals assists power play points shots plus minus hits blocks but i've also added in a couple of per game metrics and per 60 metrics when uh when it was making a difference in the data um so we'll see that in uh in some of the stuff that we look at and again this is just a first impression not a full analysis maybe if the you know if i get enough comments on this and people want want me to dive into it a little bit further uh, i can do a little bit of a longer form video or try to just corner in on um, you know maybe just goals and goals per game in one video, assists, assists per game in another video, and keep going that way. Um, so this is just a first impression, just looking at the data, the first things that I noticed, uh, that's what we're gonna uh, go over today. So as I pull this over, um, this is the dashboard I created. You can find this um, in the description below. There's a link to my Patreon. For $3 a month, uh, you can have access to all of these these uh, charts and graphs that I've created. I've done well over 20 at this point. Uh, and you'll also get easy, uh, first access to a lot of this data because I usually post the data before I do the videos. So for $3 a month, you, you can get access to that very quickly and easily. For $5 a month in the Patreon, you get this data as well as access to a private Discord server where you can ask me questions about your specific team. And I will use all of the data tools that I use in this video uh, and in all the videos that I do to try to help your specific team. So it's basically like getting uh, fantasy uh, counseling or guidance or fantasy uh, you know, expertise added to your team. Um, and it's only $5 a month. I tried to keep it as affordable as possible. Um, obviously, they take some fees out of that. So, you know, it's it's as low as I could possibly make it for all you guys. Uh, who wanted to do that. So as we look at the goals, um, obviously the first thing you notice is Austin Matthews. That's a good season for most players, 35 goals. He did that in 38 games in the back half of the season, 0.92 goals per game. That is almost 
an 82 goal per season pace. That's probably high 70s uh, in terms of if that was a 82 game uh, pace, if he could keep that up. Uh, so that is absolutely insane. Obviously, Kaprizov, he's another skilled uh, goal scorer. He's a winger, so he might be a little bit more positional value for you. 0.68, so that's almost 0.3 lower than Austin Matthews. He still put up 30 goals in 44 games. So that's the, the gap between the best guy uh, in the second half of last year and the second best guy. That's a pretty substantial gap. Um, obviously, some of these names at the top you're going to notice. Lindholm had a 40-goal season. Dreisaitl is usually a 50-goal guy. Marner actually put some goals in the net as opposed to just being assist heavy. So in the second half of last year, he was putting uh, uh, that's basically very close to, if not a 50 goal pace uh, for Mitch Marner in the back half of the season. So that's an extremely good uh, sign if you're a Marner fan and if you're an owner uh, this season. Jason Robertson, he's a goal heavy winger and he was putting up right about the same pace. The first thing that kind of stuck out in this data is Brock Nelson. So 24 goals in 46 games. Now, if you remember, the Islanders had to make up a ton of games. So they had a lot more games in that time frame uh, from when I did the analysis. This wasn't doing the analysis from every team's 42nd game and on. It was from the midpoint of the season on, just to give you a sense of general trends. So they did play more games, so he does have more goals. His goals per game is a .52. Um, so that is, I believe, a 40-goal pace. Uh, it's a, a little bit over a 40-goal pace. 40-goal pace is .487. So um, he was doing very well in the back half of last season. I would maybe look to that to continue this year, and he has almost no name value. Um, you could pretty much have him in the 16th round if you want. Uh, if you want a goal-scoring center deeper in your draft, that could be a decent play just given the fact that he turned it on last year. And they have a new coach this year. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, Brock Nelson is not a sexy file, um, but you know, if you're looking for that kind of player, you know, with no name value that does put up pretty decent numbers, you could go there. Um, another guy I noticed Tage Thompson. So he had an excellent season last year, 40 plus goals. I think it was 41 goals on the end of the season. And then he ends up cashing in, in the off season, a massive deal of, you know, I don't really know who's giving out contracts in Buffalo over the last number of years, but they've been doing a terrible job. Um, But I don't necessarily dislike Tage Thompson as a player. I just didn't like the contract because you look at this production, that's a 50 goal pace. So 0.615, that's a 50 goal pace over 82 games. And he had, you know, 24 and 39. That's really good. Um, And I believe last year he was three position eligible. He mainly played center, but he, he started out as a wing in his career. So he, he would give you additional value with that position assignment if he does get that this year. Another thing that I've noticed, and I brought this up in a previous video, Cole Caulfield, the back half, so this is the back half of the season. So in a previous video, I said in, in a certain uh, amount of games, he was putting up a six, seven, five goal per game average. So this is a little bit less because it, it does include uh, some time where uh, Dominic Ducharme was his coach. Um, And so he ends up with 22 goals in 38 games. But that is still, um, I believe, that's well over a 40-goal pace. And I believe it's right around, if not a 50-goal pace. So if you're looking for deeper value, if you watched my mock draft video, I got Cole Caulfield in the eighth round. To be able to get a 50-goal pace winger in the eighth round is insane. Um, And you're probably not going to find that every year. So if you're looking for uh, goal coverage and you don't really mind plus minus, because as we will probably take a look uh, a little bit later, um, just quickly at the plus minus, he was pretty bad. And most of those Montreal Canadiens guys are going to be bad for plus minus. But, um, you know, really good goal numbers there. Another guy I wanted to look at, um, Evander Kane. Obviously, he didn't play the first half of the season. So this is just his season last year. Um, but he did extremely well, and he'll factor into some of these other categories that we'll go over uh, in this video as well. Kevin Fiala, he is the definition of a second-half player. Um, every year he does this, basically. So, you know, 22 goals in 44 games, that's .5 right on the nose. That's a you know, a little bit more than a 40-goal pace, probably a 42-goal uh, pace over 82-game season. Uh, and again, he will factor into a bunch of these other graphs, so I will mention him as we go through them. You can see a lot of the usual names here, Ovechkin, uh, Philip Forsberg, Pasternak, JT Miller uh, popped off this year, so he's here. Kucherov, 
uh, and then we work our way down, you know, nothing crazy, nothing surprising um, in some of these files. But then you look at Dylan Strom, never thought of him as a goal guy. Um, you know, he did do well. Uh, I think it was his first year in Chicago. He put up 57 points or somewhere in that range. But I thought it was assist heavy. And so here, looking at this, 40 games played, 18 goals, 0.45 uh, goals per game. So that is just under a 40 goal pace. Um, and now he's going to Washington where he's going to potentially be the third line center. Uh, maybe he factors in on the wing because they, they still do have Lars Eller, uh, Kuznetsov. It just depends on the health of Backstrom. If Backstrom's out for a while, he might be the number two center. So that could be a decent value play in a really deep league. If you're looking for goal coverage, um, and you know, not a lot of name value in that, that file. Um, Brady Kachuk, he will factor into a bunch of these, uh, these charts later on. Um, I don't want to spend too, too much time here. As we look at the goal per game numbers, a little bit changes. Just if you look at the top of this list, Gabe Landeskog, 15 goals in 19 games at the end of the season, 0.789 goal per game average. That is an absolutely insane pace. That's a 64 goal uh, pace during an 82 game season. And that's probably unsustainable uh, longer term. But, you know, for that short sample size, that was incredible. 15 goals in 19 games. And, you know, again, I don't really think of him as a top goal scorer. Um, but when he can do that in a small sample size, that kind of does open your eyes a little bit. Obviously, Kaprizov's up here, McKinnon, Lindholm. And then you see Jack Hughes rocket up this board. So that .64 goals per game, that's well over 50 goal pace. Uh, that is actually 52 goal pace. Um, to be exact, and he went off in the back half of the season. You'll see him in the assists or the points per game numbers, some of the uh, the other numbers as well. Um, but he's a guy who, you know, he does have name value because he was the number one overall pick. But, um, you know, a lot of people are shying away from Jersey this year. And if you watch my mock draft video, I passed on him by, you know, not by accident. I just didn't um, didn't fully realize that he was there on the board. And, and I mentioned that if I had it to do over again, I would have taken him instead of Rope Hints. And this is kind of why, because he's this prolific and, and you don't think of him as a goal scorer either. He's kind of, you know, skinny, he's probably like 170 pounds soaking wet. Um, but he did score quite a bit of, you know, goals down the stretch last season. So could be something to monitor when he's outpacing guys like Ovechkin and Dreisaitl. Um, so, you know, another thing to keep in the back of your mind, here's Cole Caulfield down in this range and pretty much on this list, um, I tried to, to figure out who was in the top 10th percentile in all of these lists. So, uh, for goals, the, the total goal number, it was 22. So anybody above Stamkos here was, uh, uh in the top 10th percentile of this data set. Um, and then for goals per game. Um, that's a little bit different. It's 0.563, which uh, I believe is a mid 40 goal pace. So we'll have to take a look here. Um, I don't know why this is lagging so bad, um, but we have, let's see if I can pause this. Okay, it stopped lagging. So um, at the goal per game pace, uh, 0.5. 6-3 is the top 10th percentile. So you're looking right here. Bo Horvat is in the top 10th percentile, which is really good. 18 goals in 32 games uh, down the stretch for Bo Horvat. I would look for him to take another jump. A lot of this has to do with that Bruce Boudreaux bump. Um, when he became the coach there in Vancouver, everybody kind of had a, a bump in production, including, um, if you look, he's probably a little bit further up on this list, Elias Pettersson. Um, he was dead as a doornail earlier on and 22 goals in the, the final 38 games, 0.579 pace. Um, so that's a 47 goal pace. Now I heard a rumor last year that he didn't have his usual sticks or his usual pattern, uh, for his curve, whatever the, the case was, he must've gotten that, uh, figured out towards the end of the year. Either he adjusted to a new stick or he finally found his old ones. Um, but whatever happened, 47 goal pace in the back half of the year. And he's, Basically, at this pace, he's hitting kind of what we would think of him as in terms of his potential. He had a really good rookie season and then has kind of underwhelmed just a little bit since that point. So he, it could be time for him to take a, a step in the right direction um, and enter into that point per game range. And if he could do so with a, you know, a, a bunch of goals in that range, the point five seven nine range, that's really excellent as well. Um, as we move to assists, uh, some of these 
are pretty obvious. Mitch Marner, Johnny Goudreau, Huberdeau, uh, Roman Yossi, the first defenseman on here, and that's incredible. To see him at 43 assists, um, and the, the Jonathan Huberdeau, we think of as one of the best passers in the game. We also think of Marner and Goudreau that way, and so for Yossi to be up there, that's a, a really big accomplishment for a defenseman. He completely carried that offense, in my opinion, last year. He was up in the rush all the time. And then it's really impressive to see him just be the first guy up on the rush and then the first guy back, too. Um, that has nothing to do with assists. But nonetheless, a really great player. He's getting drafted very high this year in my mock draft. He went in the second round, so just be uh, mindful of that. Obviously, some of the usual suspects, McDavid, Panarin, Miller, Kane, Matthew Kachuk, actually uh, really good assist numbers here. Makar, uh, slightly under Yossi but you're getting a, a, a bump in goals. So Makar had 28 goals last year. Yossi had 23. So that's the basic difference between the two. Um, and then as you look a little bit further down, you know, again, it's a lot of the same things, but then Matthews, so 30 assists in 38 games. He did a little bit more than just score at a ridiculous pace in terms of goals. He was also throwing some assists at that uh, as well, and that uh, ended up with him winning the Hart Trophy at a 1.45 point-per-game pace. So... Um, you know, these are the usual suspects for the most part in the assist realm. Nothing crazy there. Assist per game, Huberto takes the top spot. Uh, there's nothing uh, that would make you think otherwise necessarily. Um, Goudreau did do incredibly well, um, but he just, I guess, per game wise, didn't uh, hit the same numbers as Huberto. Yossi's even higher on this list, which is crazy. Panarin, um, he's, you know, if he dropped a, a tiny bit last year, he's usually between a top three and a top 10 uh, assist guy and point guy in the league. Um, doesn't score a lot of goals, usually in the 25 to 30 range. Um, but this is his bread and butter. Um, no pun intended. And then if you look a little bit further down, you're obviously going to see Patrick Kane, Goudreau, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know why he calls him Quinton Hughes, but I guess that's his actual full name. Um, this data, by the way, was brought uh, to you and me by Quant Hockey. So uh, quanthockey.com. Um, I didn't have that in the description. I'll try to make sure I, I add that in uh, before this video goes up. Now, as we look at the point per game numbers, um, Austin Matthews in the second half of the season, 1.7 point per game average. Just, I mean, look at Connor McDavid. Connor McDavid's five-year average was a 1.5 or 1.55, I believe, because I think he slightly underperformed his five-year average. And that is, uh, you know, he's basically putting up one of the best point-per-game averages in the last 30 years. You're going, you know, all the way back to maybe Yager in the 90s and Lemieux in the 90s to find a guy who outperformed Connor McDavid. But then three guys did it last year, and McD or, uh, Matthews obliterated him in the back half, 65 points in 38 games. So he turned it on. Marner was riding shotgun for that, so he ended up at 1.65. So that's really good for both of these Leaf guys, and nothing's going to change. If you want to pick one of these guys up, their offense is still going to be uh, you know, just as good as it was last year. Um, I don't necessarily see it being better unless Nick Robertson gets a, a better look and you know joins the top nine and does something there. But you know, they're, they're still a very prolific offense that you can tap into. Huberto, 1.54. I would just look at this as, you know, there's almost no way that he's going to keep up this pace in the first half of this new season where he's moving. You know, I would venture to say that's one of the farthest distances to move uh, in the NHL. The only further place you could go is maybe Edmonton or Vancouver going from South Florida all the way to Calgary and then trying to, you know, assimilate, make new friends, uh, figure out your housing situation, et cetera. That 1.54 second half pace that he was at is probably not sustainable for the first chunk of the season this year. Um, so I would expect a little bit of regression there. McDavid can obviously keep up this pace uh, for as long as he wants, as long as he stays healthy. And then you're seeing a lot of the same names uh, that you would usually expect Um the bottom of these lists is kind of interesting as well. Um, just looking at it because, you know, some of these um, trends are, they go both ways. It's not just about who's at the top, it's at the bottom. Um, this particular, uh, you know, like Vincent Trocek, 0.548 in the second half last season. That's not great. Um, 23 points in 42 games. So he started relatively hot and faded a little bit. Same thing with like Shea Theodore here. Um, 
William Carlson, they just didn't have a lot going on there in Vegas, especially down the stretch. Um, you know, Van Riemsdyk, they, Philly had nothing going on there. Um, some of these guys are a little bit further down just because, like, if you look at Morrissey. After the coaching change, not much went right in Winnipeg. They didn't do terribly, but they weren't, um, you know, they, they could have easily made the playoffs. The, the door was wide open for them uh, if they would have just taken it and run with it after the coaching change, but they didn't do that. Um, but as we'll, we'll see in a couple of these, uh, the bottom of the graph is sometimes as interesting as the top. Um, but a couple other things I wanted to, to make a, a note of here in this point per game data. Um, if you look, Kevin Fiala, 1.27 point per game average in the back half, 56 points in 44 games. He does this every year. And if you don't pay attention to it, you'll miss it. So what the play for Fiala is, don't draft him. Wait. Somebody will draft him a little bit too high this year, expecting him to, to go off in, in Los Angeles, which doesn't make any sense because they have a terrible offense. And then they will get frustrated with him and drop him. If they drop him any time before December, January, in that range, grab him off the waiver wire. Uh, even if he starts a little slow, look at what he did in the second half last year. And I'm telling you, this is not just this past season. Um, I'm, maybe if I can delve into the data a little bit more, I'll find some more evidence of that, but just take my word for it. This guy's a second half player, if I've ever seen one. If you look at Jack Hughes' point per game, 1.28. So basically the same type of production in the second half. He only played 25 games. He was a little injured. Um, so again, something to keep in mind. Um, as we move a little bit further down this list, actually, I wanted to make a note of Patrick Kane. So 1.4 point per game, 56 points in 40 games for Patrick Kane. And you'll remember, this is right around the same time that they traded Flurry. They got rid of Brandon Hagel. They started tearing everything down. So he had a lot fewer players to work with. Um, and there was not a lot of optimism, not a lot of offense uh, in terms of, or I guess maybe a little bit less defense than offense. They, they still had Kane and a couple of other producers to bring it and whatnot, but that's incredible. And so if you're thinking that Pat Kane isn't going to be able to put this type of season up again, maybe not 1.4, I'll give you that. But at the same time, he can do quite a bit with not that much around him. Um, now, he did have to bring it last year, but this year he won't. So maybe that is due for a little bit of regression, but this guy is as you know consistent as they come, usually 1.1 plus point per game guy, whether he has talent around him or not. Um, so don't shy away from Patrick Kane. He's been drafted in the third round in some of my leagues. He's usually a rock solid first rounder. So if you um, if you see him there in the third round, just grab him. Don't worry about it because he might also get traded. You never know. He could be traded before the season starts. He could be traded by the deadline. And there's no way to to predict that. But if you're fading him, thinking he's on the worst offense, then just you know keep that in the back of your mind. Um, on top of that. I did want to mention JT Miller. So if I can find him here, a lot of these guys get lost. He's up at the top. So 1.475 point per game, 59 points in 40 games. And that probably got him that massive new contract that he got right as I was uploading the contract year video with him in it. So um, thanks for that, JT. But I guess you earned that money for sure. Um, and then another guy I wanted to mention a little bit further down. Uh, if I can find him again, there's so many names on this list. This is exactly why I didn't add 800 names to this list. Um, but the guy I wanted to, to highlight was Mark Shifley. Um, and he turned it on right after I dropped him. So I, I picked him in the fifth or sixth round last year, thinking of him as a point per game center, similar in the same kind of vein as Mika Zibanejad, just less goal heavy. Um, and that's what the data was telling me before last season. He just started slow. He wasn't very good. He didn't have a lot going on, underperforming, not terrible. He was still ownable. I didn't drop him. It took me until probably about January when I dropped him. And then when I did, um, the guy who won my league, AC Delaware River, who I've mentioned in a couple of videos, he picked him up and had him for the whole playoff and won the league. So uh, let that be a lesson to me, I guess. But a 1.23 point per game average, 42 points in 34 games. So he kind of trended in the right direction at the end of last season. So maybe look at that. If you're looking to pick him up this year, uh, probably would do so after the fifth or sixth round, though. Uh, he would be in the seven to nine range uh, if I'm going to draft him again this year. Uh, again, I'm not going to go over every single one of these because there's a lot of information here. But if you look at the power play points, the usual suspects are at the top. But these guys are all Tampa Bay Lightning, Kucherov, Stamkos, Hedman. 
obviously Kaprizov, McDavid, Miller, Huberdeau, all these guys, very good. But it gets a little different as you change uh, what the the parameters are. So point uh, power play points per game average, you still have the same three guys at the top. A little bit different shuffle here. Malkin factors in because Malkin didn't play a lot of games. So he's in this list, and I mentioned him in the previous video, the mock draft video, um, point per game guy, excellent. Top five power play point producers in the league last year. And in that mock draft, I ended up with Panarin, Malkin, um, and I can't think of the other guy right off the top of my head. Actually, McDavid, that's obvious. Um, so McDavid was a little bit further down here, but I had those three guys, so I was dominating power play points per game. But just notice these names on the left here, and then as we switch to power play points per 60, Panarin rockets to the top of the list, and Miller goes above Hedman and Kucherov and Stamkos. So what this tells me is Panarin is the best power play guy in the league, but he just didn't get that many uh, opportunities on the power play, or his, his power play minutes were lower than the guys on Tampa. So Tampa might get more power plays, than the Rangers, which, uh, you know, this is what the data is telling us a little bit here. These three guys are all in the same range, 9-4, 9-5, 9-6. And then Panarin, way above everybody else, just didn't get the same power play looks uh, that everybody else got. So if you're looking um, at a differentiating factor between two of these guys, this is where you could look. You could find this, uh, this data, again, uh, on the Patreon link uh, in the description below. Josh Norris. This is really good for Josh Norris. 15 power play points in the back half of the season, 31 games. So that's basically a power play goal every other game, or power play point every other game. Uh, 0.48 is a really good uh, per game number as well. Kerfoot, this is a bit of a statistical anomaly. So one power play point in 44 games. He might have gotten like two shifts on the power play and scored a point on one of them. So that's how he's on this list. If you look at Teravainen, very good power play guy, 16 in 39. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of that, but at the same time, he's one of the you know the power play guys in Carolina. They have a really good unit. Um, Pedersen should be there, and a lot of this is I'm imagining a couple goals factored in there, considering he was in that uh, 47 goal pace that we mentioned before. Uh, Noah Dobson, you know that's really good production, and that's why he's going a lot higher in drafts this year. So I've noticed that Pulak is dropping like a rock and Dobson is shooting up the board uh, for this reason probably because that .36 power play point per game number and then this uh, power play point per 60 number is very good as well. Um, so you can, again, find these in the description uh, below. Um, as we move into shots, this was a little bit more um, kind of what you'd expect at the top here, Matthews, M McKinnon, Pasternak, but Timo Meyer. So last year I did the uh, the the 21-22 uh, analysis of the owners box mock draft and he went in the 16th round last year. If you got him there and you were in a keeper league and you keep Timo Meyer in that keeper league and you lose your 16th round pick, that's incredible value because he's going in the top 5 rounds this year because of this production. 4.35 shots per game is very very high and he was right around a point per game average last season he's on a bad team he's getting all the good looks power play time etc um, so yeah just a, a thing to keep in mind here Timo Meyer is an excellent shot guy uh, apparently and then another guy I didn't really expect Patrice Bergeron four shots a game average and if you'll notice the entire perfection line is in the top 10 so you have Pasternak Bergeron and then Marchand right here so something to keep in mind once those guys get healthy that will be a uh, high shot volume line if they reunite those guys. I've mentioned Jack Eichel before. He was uh, putting up a ton of shots when he was healthy despite having a broken thumb. Um, you know, Nick Ehlers, that's a really good shot number for a guy who makes most of his living with his legs as opposed to his shot. Um, but that's really excellent shot production out of him. Um, and he should be looking uh, for a bounce back this season. I believe he missed some time last year. So if, if he's healthy and ready to go, um, I just don't know what to make of Winnipeg. I don't know how much better or worse they're going to be uh, given the changes that they've made there. But nonetheless, the shot numbers, another thing that sticks out, you know, Jack Hughes, 3.56 shots per game. Wouldn't have expected that. Again, he, he looks like he's going to get blown over in the wind, and yet he's 
you know, putting up three and a half shots a game. He's scoring at a 50 goal pace. He's well over 1.1 points per game average. This is why I consider him deep, deep value because he's probably not going to go in the top five or six rounds. If he does, then that's pretty much where he belongs. If he's there after those, those ranges, then you definitely want to try to make a point to grab him because this is the ceiling. This is what he did last year and they've gotten better. They got Palat. They brought over Eric Halla to give some center depth support. Um, it, you know, Holtz might factor into the top nine this year. Uh, they've got a lot of things brewing in New Jersey, at least on their offense. Um, and this could be a, a deep value play depending on how your league shakes out. Um, Evander Kane, 3.53 shots per game. And he'll, you know, we've, we factored him in uh, a little bit earlier talking about him. And we will factor him, him in again because if you look at his shot numbers, uh, he's with guys like Debrinkit, who shoots obviously dry sidle, Kaprizov, Kadri's there. Um, some of these D Yossi, um, you got Malkin in the same range, but so this is how elite Kane is at shooting. He obviously was a, a heavy goal producer last year. Um, and then on top of that, his hits. So he's third on this list in hits. Now reminder, this is just the top 200 point producers. So you're not getting a lot of the hits D like Radko Gudis and Ristolainen and Larson and others. You're not getting Tanner Janot. So this is just the offensive guys that hit. And this may be a very valuable stat for you guys because these this will show you who you should draft if you're choosing between two players or if you want to try to corner the market on hits specifically, but you don't want to give up offensive production. So you'd go with the guy like Kachuk or a little bit deeper valued. You'd go with Evander Kane. And then one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, and I, I really wonder if this is a... a, a problem with the data or if it's just a weird anomaly look at Brady Kachuk all the way up here let's find Matthew Kachuk where is Matthew oh wait he's down here 1.022 hits per game I never would have guessed that ever so it kind of makes me wonder if there's a, a, a problem with this data I will do another deep dive and check into this uh, before the next video on this but that is a big uh, differentiating factor if you're choosing between the two Kachucks I've already mentioned some of the other factors um, Matthew going to a new team having a massive new contract having to make chemistry with all new players etc on top of that he apparently in the second half last year didn't get the hits production anywhere close to what his brother got and Brady's in a much better situation offensively speaking in the top six this year um, in my opinion now obviously Matthew's going to be playing with some great players as well you know Barkoff etc uh, but this is just something to differentiate the two. If you look at the hits, 3.304 versus 1.02, um, it's a no-brainer there. Um, Svechnikov hits like, you know, one of these type top five guys. He's a Ovechkin type, and he could be ready for a breakout offensive season. It just depends on, uh, you know, if he's ready to take that next step. Jordan Stahl, that's pretty high there. He could be a deep value play if you're in a league with face-offs. He wins a ton of face-offs and he hits. So that could be very valuable to you as well if you're looking for a guy. I've had a couple of people in my comments ask about face-offs. Um, he could be a very good play for your face-off league. And I remember two years ago, he was actually putting up close to a point-per-game average in the second half of the season when I owned him. Um, another thing that you might want to keep in the back of your mind. Um, again, Mo Sider. I've mentioned him a couple of times here. So as we look at the hits data, what you can notice here is there's the top uh, the top D um, are on this list are basically Cider, Latang, Justin Falk, Charlie McAvoy, Josh Morrissey, Jeff Petrie, and Rasmus Dahlin. All of those guys are in the top 10th percentile for this category, for this metric. Um, so they're all in the top 10th percentile of the top 200 point per game players sorted by hits per game. So what you're getting out of those guys, you're getting offensive production, um, whatever that factors into, whether it's a power play, uh, you know, point production or a goal or, or, you know, Justin Falk is mainly a goal guy. You could use him for goals and hits if you wanted to do that uh, as a D3. You could specifically try to get those two categories with him. Or you could go for a guy like Latang, who pretty much covers everything. And then on top of that gets 2.175 hits. Um, or, you know, what we have saw out of Mo, Mo Sider last year was uh, a very, very good rookie season with all kinds of category coverage. You do not see that normally out of rookies in their first year um, f 
in terms of being fantasy relevant in so many different areas. So Mo Sider is being drafted like like that. He's being drafted in that mid range, that four to six round range, um, and he should be drafted there because of this hits production. As we go to blocks, Jeff Petrie's at the top of this list. Mo Sider's right there, so that you know factors into that as well. A lot of defensemen at the top of this list for obvious reasons, um, but Petrie going to the Penguins. This could be an interesting idea because he was top tenth percentile in hits, and now he's factoring in 2.23 blocks per game. So he could be a hits and blocks guy who might actually get you some goal production uh, with the Penguins as they, they have a, a better offense maybe uh, than um, where he's been in the past. He's had some good teams in the past, but in terms of this year coming from last year, uh, I definitely think Pittsburgh is an upgrade over Montreal. Um, so that could be a deeper value play for your D3 if you're looking for hits and blocks. Um, and then obviously some of the elite defensemen are up here, Hedman, Yossi. So if you're determining between Makar, Fox, Hedman, Yossi, this is the kind of data that you can look at. You can say, okay, Yossi, he had a ton of assists. He was you know, at the top three or four in the assist category on this uh, data set. In, top, in, in terms of blocks, he's in the top five. Um, he wasn't that high in hits, but he you know, had a 1.2 point per game average. So this could be the determining factor between those two guys because obviously Fox isn't going to shoot as much. Uh, he's not going to score as many goals as Yossi, that kind of thing. And he's definitely not going to get blocks the way that these guys do. Adam Fox is down here at 1.08, which isn't bad, but it's not uh, anything near the, the top of this list. Um, and then as we move to plus minus quickly to wrap things up, not a lot that you wouldn't expect here. Um, Vander Kane's a little bit higher than I would have expected. Um, but, you know, just really good players on really good teams. So you got the the three guys in Calgary. You got Makar, obviously, McAvoy, very good uh, plus-minus numbers, Evander Kane. Slavin was really good for this last year, and he also got some hits and blocks uh, and a little bit of offensive production. Uh, Bunting on that Toronto team. Uh, it's interesting that Bunting is the top guy, though, from the Toronto Maple Leafs on this list because he, you know, you would have expected, you know, Matthews or somebody. Matthews is down here, still very good, but you would have expected a little bit more. One of those guys, Marner's right below him, so not crazy. Um, Jared Spurgeon, very good plus minus defenseman. So if you have this category, he, he's probably going to fall in your draft a little bit. So keep this in mind uh, if you're looking for a deeper value plus minus guy. Um, and then, you know, the usual suspects for a lot of these, uh, you got, you know, Matthews and Huberto and McKinnon and Bergeron and all these guys. Then you get to the bottom of the list. Um, so you're getting a lot of Detroit Red Wings, Raymond, Bertuzzi, Larkin. Um, if your league doesn't have plus minus, don't shy away from these guys. These are all very good offensive producers. Larkin was close to a point per game. Bertuzzi was close to a point per game. Raymond wasn't as close, but he was still uh, a 30 goal winger. So there's value there if you're not in a league with plus minus. This is a little surprising. Nylander minus 14. I suppose he does a lot of his work on the power play. Uh, that would be my main explanation as to why that is. But if you're a Leaf fan and you understand this more than me, maybe he just sucks defensively. Who knows? Um, but yeah, you can leave a comment and, and let me know how off base I am with Nylander. Um, and then, you know, some of these guys, Burns is probably going to improve on that going to a much better team. Um, so some of these guys, Kessel will probably improve on that going to Vegas as opposed to Arizona. Um, so there is some value to be had at the bottom of this list. You don't necessarily want to write any of these guys in this range off just because of a minus nine. You can easily make up for that by getting one of these top plus minus guys. If you're looking to do that and try to combine the two, um, the best thing that you want is you, you want your, your entire team per player to average, you know, a plus five plus 10, um, so that you're, you're well over the normal, uh, category coverage level. So if somebody else is going to have, you know, one or two plus minus guys, if you can make your whole team relatively good with plus minus, and then you want to, you know, bring in one of these guys like a Raymond or a Larkin or somebody like that, it's not going to kill you because you're, you're probably still going to be set. And if you watch my mock draft, that's pretty much what happened. I had three guys, including Caulfield who were uh, pretty significant minuses, and then the rest of them were were pretty significant uh, plus players. So that made up for the difference there. Um, but yeah, this is this is all of the data. I didn't go too deep in any of these, but it still ended up being a massively long video. I'm really 
trying to keep these uh, a bit shorter, but it just never seems to happen because there's a lot to go into. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you again for watching and paying attention. Um, you know, remember to leave a like and subscribe if you want to do that. I don't want to shill for it, so uh, do it if you want. Uh, but share this around with your friends if you got some value out of this. And uh, again, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.